Hello and welcome back to this video series on global health ethics. This is the second episode in the series in which we're taking a look at some of the principles that underpin moral and ethical issues in the global health space. In this episode, we're going to take a closer look at two pretty controversial and certainly opposing ideas about how to decide what is right or moral. And then in future episodes, we're going to untangle them a little bit more and try to understand how to apply these ideas in global health ethical issues. The first idea that we'll look at is called utilitarianism. This is basically the theory that proposes that the right course of action is the one that maximizes utility, which is usually defined as maximizing happiness or reducing suffering. Now we're going to come back to this idea of utilitarian ethics in just a minute. For now, it suffice to say that this is an example of consequentialism. Uh, and that is to say that uh, consequen consequentialism is basically the idea that the moral value of an action is determined by its consequences. Let's take a look at a contrasting idea, and that is of deontological ethics. This was pr first proposed by Immanuel Kant. Here, the morality of an action is based on the action's adherence to rules and duties. Kant argues that it's not the consequence of an action that makes them right or wrong, but the motives of the person who carries them out in the first place. Some deontologists are what we call moral absolutists, and they believe that there are certain actions which are absolutely right or absolutely wrong, regardless of the consequence of the actions and regardless of the intention behind them. So what we've got really, there, and there's many more, but what we've talked about is three frameworks for talking about ethics. The, one, the first is utilitarian ethics. So whether something's right or wrong is a function of whether it translates into the greatest good for the most number of people. The second is Kant's deontological ethics, which basically says whether something's right or wrong is a function of the motives behind the action. And the third is this absolutism, there's certain rules, there's right actions and wrong actions, and they're right or wrong regardless of what happens because of them and regardless of the motives behind them. Now there's a tendency of people, when confronted with these two opposing ideas, utilitarian ethics and deontological ethics, to immediately place themselves in one of the two camps. We tend to have a knee-jerk philosophical reaction of some kind. And then once we've taken a position, we've placed ourselves in one of these camps, we then try and find examples and anecdotes to bolster that position. I'd like to introduce you to an interesting thought experiment. This was introduced by a lady by the name of Philippa Foote in 1967, and it's called the trolley problem. Now imagine a trolley or a tram hurtling down a track, and imagine that down the line an evil villain has tied five people to the track, and they're all going to get killed when the trolley hits them. Interestingly, you find yourself standing next to a lever, and if you pull that lever, the trolley will be diverted onto an alternative track. And on this alternative track, though, there's another man, and he's been tied down, and if the trolley hits him, he's going to die. But on that track, there's just one man and not five. So the question is, should you pull the lever and so divert the trolley from the track on which it will kill five people onto the track in which it will only kill one person? Studies show that the overwhelming majority of people say yes. And that's a typical utilitarian position. One person dying is better than five people dying. Now let's make the scenario a little more complicated. Imagine that the trolley is once again hurtling down and there's five people tied to the track. This time, however, there's no lever to pull. Instead, you're standing on a footbridge that goes over the track. You've got the option of pushing a tramp off the bridge onto the track and thereby stopping the trolley and saving the five people. But of course, you'll kill the tramp in the process. Faced with the second scenario, most people do not believe that it's right to push the tramp off the bridge, even though the net result of this action would be exactly the same as the first scenario. That is, one person would be sacrificed in order to save five others. Killing is wrong even if the net result is to save others. This is a position that's consistent with the deontological ethical framework. Now, as you can imagine, this trolley experiment can be extended in a number of ways. So, for example, what would you do if you didn't have to push the tramp off the footbridge, but you could instead pull a lever that would open a trap door through which the tramp would fall onto the tracks, stopping the trolley and saving the five lives. But of course, again, the tramp would die. And what if the tramp on the bridge were actually the evil villain who tied the five people to the track in the first place? Or uh, what if it wasn't just five people tied to the track? What if it was 100 people or the entire population of a small village in a developing country? 
trolley experiment illustrates the extent to which our subjective position on an issue of right or wrong is dramatically and compellingly changed by the context in which we make that decision. Interestingly, functional MRI brain scans of individuals faced with these trolley experiments show that variation in the scenario causes completely different parts of the brain to be involved with decision making. And so even though a completely different decision gets made, people always seem to believe that their latest decision is the morally correct thing. Now, if you were hoping that by the end of this talk, I'd have provided you with a simple paint by numbers uh, yardstick to resolve ethical dilemmas, well, I'm sorry to disappoint. The truth is that even though we think we subscribe to some sort of watertight framework for determining right from wrong, there are lots of examples, particularly in the extreme, where both the utilitarian and the deontological ethical frameworks seem to fall apart. The lesson here is not to be overly concrete in your thinking on ethical issues. The starting point should always be to have a detailed understanding of the issue that you're dealing with and understand all sides of the debate. In any ethical debate, you've got people in both camps that tend to be extremely emotional. Now, if you want me to take your argument seriously, you need to show me that you can argue the counterfactual. If you can't, then it's likely that you've taken an unthinking, dogmatic position based on some sort of knee-jerk philosophical reaction that you have, and you really need to take a closer look at the other side of the argument. Okay, and that's the end of this episode, and you might feel that we've raised more questions than we've really answered. Well, don't panic. This is just episode number two, and there's gonna be more to come. In future episodes, we'll continue to try and build up a toolbox of ideas and frameworks, and hopefully empower you to make more sense of global health ethical issues. So tune into the next video, and we'll take a closer look at some of these issues. Remember that if you subscribe to this channel, you'll get an email alert whenever a new video is posted. As always, thank you very much to the happyyellowamp.com for helping with the presentation.